And now, if you would, let me introduce you to my world record leg trap. Hey, folks, do me a favor. Practice CPR, catch, photo, and release. The future of fishing is truly in your hands. On your left, you can almost see it. One of the most magnificent sights on the planet, Lake Athabasca nestled just below the 60th parallel. Lake Athabasca hasn't changed in nearly a thousand years with its pristine shorelines, pure crystal clear water you can actually drink, and countless fish. Boy, has she got fish that is for everyone willing to travel to Other Side River Lodge. From the magnificent world-class northern pike that prowl these waters to the oldest and biggest lakers on the globe, Athabasca has it all. Other Side River Lodge caters to the true sportsman seeking an all-American plan guided package with three incredible meals a day and memories you won't find anywhere else. Records have been broken by guests at Other Side River Lodge in the past. You could be next. Book your dream trip of a lifetime to Other Side River Lodge where fishing dreams do come true. Call Cliff or Stella toll free at 1-877-922-0957. Hi everyone, it's 7.30, it's Wednesday night, and you know what that is. It's time for Fish and Sticks Live here on Facebook. This is Bob Mesacomer, welcoming everybody to the show. Hey, listen, um, let me start out by saying this. Um, knowledge is generally obtained through experiences. And if you experience enough to gain knowledge, you also gain in the process wisdom. That being said, we're going to take on a subject tonight that I never thought I would talk about. And the reason is I have stood in front of tens of thousands in seminars across the United States and appeared in front of millions on TV and really said, I don't do it and I don't support it. Well, you've got to be perfectly honest with you. That's a narrow-minded approach, and I did it. For years, because my my biggest concern was the fish. That's my ultimate concern. But there's a lot going on in this sport, and there's an awfully big window that takes place in the fall. And there are physiological reasons why one process or one type of fishing will outfish another. So that being said, I want to walk through a little bit of what we're going to do tonight. And we've got a special, a very special guest on with us tonight. He's going to walk us through it. He's a master at this. And then I'm going to tell you what we're going to do on the water next week. Because Matt Horvat, a very good friend of mine, who has been absolutely begging me, begging me for six or seven years to go out and do this. Go out and try it. Go out and see what it's all about. And Matt's convinced me we're, we're heading to the water tomorrow. We're going to shoot. Uh, we're going to shoot probably three or four days, see if we can get you guys some even more information and maybe some big fish. Who knows? You know, God's willing, we'll do it. But before we get that, uh, before we get that far along, I want to make sure that everybody is aware, folks, that we've got an awful lot going on. we're trying to do. Join us in on the conversation here on Facebook, folks. You can be able to chime in with your comments. We're going to try to take those comments with our live guest tonight, and we're going to try to apply what information, knowledge, and wisdom we can obtain from talking to you folks and our guest and whatever I can extract from my own head. And we're going to bring that forward and try to make everybody a better fisherman. You have a question, you have a comment, post it in the comment section while we're on live and we'll answer those questions and take care of that for you. And do us a really, really big favor. Share the video, please. Share it with your friends, put it on your group pages, and if you would, email me bob.m at fishingstickstv.com, your name, and I will put you on the list and we will share it to your page so you don't have to physically go do it. We'll do it for you. 
So if you would step up and let us put it on your page, it'll help us grow. It'll help us send the information we want out there, uh, get it into the more and more hands of more and more anglers. You know, there's a lot of people that are watching and listening to the show that don't fish muskies and they don't fish northern pike. They're bass fishermen. They're the walleye fishermen. And there's a misconception in terms of relationship in the ecosystem when we talk about these superior predators. The more we can educate everybody as to the presence, the habits, and the instincts of these fish, the better off we're going to be as an angling society. Everybody will share the water, the fish will share the water, and everybody should come out ahead. So that being said, I'm, I'm not going to bring on our guest right quite this second, but I am going to tell you a little bit about the physiology of the fish. It's important. You know if you followed me for any length of time. I'm a stickler for science, and I'm a stickler for sticking to it. So let's just, let's just Let's just walk through this for a second if we can. Let's just take, for instance, I don't know how many people out here really know this. You've heard people say that musky fishing in the fall, the fish go on this feeding binge, okay? That's not true. The physiology of the fish dictates that the fish slows down, okay? However, their choice of forage might upgrade their habits in terms of moving become very minimal. So they have a tendency to put on weight. At the same time, you're coming into the early stages of egg generation in the females. All of these factors give you bigger fish. So in, let's take a look at the, the senses. Let's get down to why we're going to be doing what we're doing tonight, why we're talking about it, and why that period is so critical that we do it. In the summer peak, folks, that's that 77 degree range that we always talk about, the summer peak. The muskie will generally rely upon one sense to finalize the deal, if you know what I mean. That sense in most systems will be the sense of sound. And whether you're throwing a topwater bait, a blade bait, a jerk bait, all of these baits transition. They send some sort of noise into the water, which is perceived by the lateral line of the fish, gets the fish's attention. In 77 degree water or thereabouts, that fish is heightened. Its physiological need to feed is engaged. So it only takes potentially one of those senses for that fish to commit. And that's one of the reasons we see summer peak fishing. If we move on to the, the 66, 67 range right in there, we'll find out that the whole world changes all the way down to about 63 degrees. We find out that the muskies generally rely upon two senses to finalize the deal. Um, these are most commonly sight and sound combined. So as you can start to see, there's a transition in the attitude, if you will, the way the fish perceives our presence and the way the fish perceives our presentation. Water clarity is a huge, huge, or can be a huge influence regarding the primary decider of these two. And by that, I mean if you've got oligotrophy systems, the fish might tend to be more of a visual fish than it would be in darker water. And in darker water, it's going to depend on that lateral line for the sound. But regardless, when you get into that temperature range, 67, 63, 65 degrees, right in there, that fish is going to start asking you for more than one sense to be tripped to get that fish to go. So if we just simply use common sense and move forward, at 53 degrees, we're coming into that turnover period here, folks. You can expect that the fish, the decision the fish is going to make to actually take something, actually finalize the deal, will be influenced by three senses. Generally, the sense of sound, sight, and smell. Now, when I say that, fish have a very, 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 very good olfactory system. And they can pick up particles just like a dog does. When we hear about dogs being 400,000 times greater in, in sense of smell than a human being. Well, I don't know what the factor is in a fish, 
But I know for a fact that these fish follow these scent trails through their life, going through weed beds and down creek currents and whatever the case may be. So they're very attuned to it. When you get into this cold temperature range, when you start to see that 53 degree range, 54, 55, expect that that sense is also going to be triggered. So you start to see the point. The colder and colder it gets, the slower the metabolism gets, the more senses need to be engaged in the fish to finalize the deal. So if we take that at face value and move forward, then what we're looking at when we get down to 40 degrees, this is that the, this is the period that people do this and they do it successfully. Uh, you're looking at every sense the fish has got under full burden. So by the time you reach 40 degrees, all four of the predator senses may need to be engaged to finalize the deal. And if you've ever watched a fish come in behind a bait, um, I can't say I've seen it come in behind a sucker because I've never sucker fished, okay? But just behind a lure, if you see that fish come in behind a lure in these cold water situations, you'll see this little inflated membrane in the front of their mouth, and you'll see it as they're coming up on the lure. You'll watch them come in, and they'll be opening their mouth behind it. And every time they open their mouth, you'll see this envelope at the top of their at the top of their roof of their mouth just kind of falls down, falls down. That's taking in the taste. It's literally tasting what's around that bait. So the colder you get, the more this fish relies upon that sense. The point I'm making is we fish fish at summer peak, we have high activity windows. We have probabilities are off the charts. When you get into the fall period, what we're about to talk about with our guest could potentially be the best way to catch fish. And yes, I know, I just rocked everybody that's ever followed me for 35 or 40 years on television and in seminars when you heard me say, sucker fishing might be your best opportunity. That's right, I'm not responsible for the heart attacks. Don't call my doctor. We're gonna talk about why tonight. And I've got Gary Enos is on with us tonight. Gary, you there? Oh, yes I am. All right, Gary, I'm going to pull you up a little bit. Keep talking, young man. Yeah. How you doing, Bob? I'm uh, doing very well. Uh, Gary is a master at this, folks. Um, when I was doing research for this show, um, I wanted to be accurate in what we were talking about. And I was going through video after video after video, and I stumbled on Gary's videos. And I got to tell you, I, I even told this to Gary in our conversation prior to coming on the show, the best produced footage I've seen on this subject in my entire life. Um, amazing. What you did with these video clips sells the point totally. And Gary, my hat's off to you. It really is. Um, I've got your website up right now. I know you're at a you're at a, a disadvantage. You're in your truck right now. You came off the water. Hey, before we jump to that, how'd you guys do on the water today? Well, let's talk about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, let, let's just and I know that's tongue in cheek, but let's be honest about it. When we're talking about the fall period, these fish are going to yep. eat about every thirty six to forty hours. So your opportunity is greatly reduced hugely reduced over summer peak. So to come off the water and not have a fish is not, it's not that big a deal. Right, right. Well, what we're dealing with is an extended summer period. I should say, you know, our water temperature is around 60, 62 degrees when I got off the water tonight. And so it's like, you know, what, what, what do you use? You know, and it's like, you know, the use of live bait, you know, it just isn't there yet. So, right. you know, I, I was listening to what you were saying earlier, and, and you're hitting it right on the head. So, you know, the the, the use of light bait is, is greater in that colder water period. So I, I concur what you were saying. Absolutely. I have to agree with you. The fish locations are different because they're taking advantage of that solar period. They're getting up high in the column. They're going very shallow inside weed lines, sand. That makes it difficult for sucker fishing. Yes, yes, and you know we need 
you know, you I, I love sucker fishing when you, you get into that 50-degree water temperature and it's starting to drop, nice steady drop, and, and then you're going to fall into the prime time for sucker fishing. So, absolutely. Do you find uh, when you're sucker fishing, and I know all of us, let's say this way, I can't say all of us, and I hate it when people say everybody or all. I personally <laughs> like calm conditions. Do you find sucker fishing in calm conditions to be more conducive? Maybe it's just boat handling or whatever. Do you find that better? Um, yes and no. I, I don't mind uh, a little wind, you know, but I high winds tend to see you know, your, your, your boat control becomes a premium and, you know, you're going to be pushing yourself in conditions like if you're trying to work a weed edge or something like that, you're going to be, you know, in the weeds a lot and then you're getting fouled and then frustration sets in because um, the muskies are not going to be following a weed-filled sucker by any chance. So, you know, they might be interested in what are you dragging around there, but... Uh, yeah, you really, uh, you know, shoot your chances, you know, with with super high winds. So um, anything over, you know, seven to eight miles an hour wind, yeah, it does definitely uh, take away from your productiveness. So, Do you like yeah. cloudy conditions or sunny conditions? Uh, some of the biggest fish I've ever netted were were musky or uh, high skies after a front. Mm -hmm. So, bluebird skies, you know, and I've, you know, it's either way. Um, you just kind of have to, you know, work. You know, I, I know it's tough to to watch the, you know, the weather and try to figure out what they're telling you. So, you know, when you go out and just kind of, um, you know, work with the conditions that you have. But um, I'm going to have to say, Bob, that some of my biggest fish that I netted um, are on high bluebird skies. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I honestly can believe that. I honestly um, can believe it. Uh, we're having a lot of people chiming in right now that can't believe that we're talking about sucker fishing. Like I said, I, this is going <laughs> to knock some people off their chairs because I have literally stood in front of audiences <laughs> because I don't understand, didn't understand, and I want to learn, and I want to pass this information on. So, folks, stay with us. We'll be right back after this commercial break, and we'll get Gary to tell us how we're actually going to do this. How are we going to make it all work and not hurt the fish? Be right back. Look at that. Oh, big fish. Big fish. That is a 50 fish. <laughs> Folks, you're seeing it right now. My 100 just came in the net at Witch Bay Camp. Holy smokes, Rocky. He ate that thing. The summer sun never sets upon the Alaskan pike of the Yunoka, in the heart of breathtaking Alaska. Evenings will be shared reliving the battles of Monster Pike. The Midnight Sun Trophy Pike Hunt is on aboard the 67-foot luxury houseboat, and you're in command. If you're not, you should be. Contact the Midnight Sun Trophy Pike Adventures by calling 800-440-7453 or email them at mstpa50 at gmail.com. I told you it was going to be a different show tonight, folks. I told you that from the word go. Gary Enos is online with us right now. Gary has Gary's Muskie's experience. Uh, he's out of Indiana, um, I believe probably just north of Webster. Um, Gary is really, really quite taken me by surprise with his videos. Gary, you've got a first clip um, where... You're talking about how to rig the sucker. Do you want to go to that right now? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> as, as far as rigging the sucker, um, I, I make my own harnesses, and I use fluorocarbon line, um, nothing less than 130 pounds. And what I do is I, I put a um, circle hook on the very front end so I can hook that through the lip of the sucker and then I, I, I put a, uh, a crimp on that, and then on the back side, or I, excuse me, a, 
a, uh, a sleeve, a crimp sleeve, so I can adjust it to the size of the sucker. Let's take because I don't like a. Yeah. Let's take What's a look that, at your. Let's take a look at your clip, Gary. Your clip really is a nice visual aid for it, and you yep. carry it through uh, your audio track on it. Your presentation is amazing. Folks, this is what Gary's talking about in terms of rigging what he's using. Right. All right. I'm. Uh, and the I'm the, the biggest thing that I, I the, uh, that I've done is I I okay. size the and treble hook the to the sucker sort of instead thing. of putting an oversized hook on there. I like going with like a three out hook for a smaller yeah, sucker, and then I move so up it, yeah, to the larger suckers. I, I go up to a five out or sometimes you even six out. You know, through the blank of the rod down here at the butt end. Link to the handle, super not important, but this is, this is almost like the perfect setup right here. All right. The reel that I'm using is just a, um, an Akuma trolling reel. It's a, it's a 20. You don't need a whole lot of line capacity on this thing, but you can also use these for trolling. What I do is I put that line counter on there so I know exactly where I'm putting the sucker down from the surface down. And then when I'm marking bait fish, I can always put that right in the strike zone, where, right where the bait fish are. That's very important. Using 80-pound uh, uh, super braid, it is, I like to use Daiwa Samurai braid. It's a smaller diameter, about 17 pound test. It's, I use that for all casting, trolling, live bait, whatever. All right, this rig right here I'm using is made out of fluorocarbon. I make these myself, they're called the Wilson. I've worked on this for about seven years trying to get it right because I don't like using wire. Wire seven strand has a tendency to kink after some usage and also it kind of gives itself away in the water column. It's easier for the fish to see. Um, what I do is, <clears throat> I have this, is, well, let me back up here a little bit. This has got a, a slider sleeve on it. it, makes it fully adjustable for different size suckers. So if you have super large suckers, you can bring that thing all the way down. This circle hook goes into the top lip of your sucker and then this this is a three out hook. This is usually for the smaller sucker size. It goes back by the tail end of the sucker, by the dorsal fin. I'll show you show what I'm talking about here in a little bit. I just put a, a little bend in the shank of the hook at the eye so the sucker rides right through the water. That's quite interesting what you're doing there with the line counter. I never thought about doing that myself. Um, the rig yeah. you're using, you say you took a little bit of time to build that rig, huh? Yeah? Yeah, I took it from, you know, past experiences from other manufactured ones, and I wasn't happy with the results, and so I just started messing with it on my own. And, uh, you know, I, ba I basically size fit my suckers to the rig, and, and it helps tremendously. And the well, reason I like to use the fluorocarbon is because when I use <clears throat> the seven-strand wire, you get kinks in it and stuff like that and the the sucker just didn't swim natural so you the use of fluorocarbon with the uh, quick strike rig is is great what size of circle hook are you using on there um i'm thinking it's a one knot one knot okay what I know, I know. Later on in our presentation tonight, we're going to talk about the size of suckers, and I don't want to do that right now because we're going to do it on your clips. Mm -hmm. But what are we talking about in terms of expense for suckers? Um, here in Indiana, I pay around anywhere from five to five fifty, um, and it really doesn't depend on size. So you know, the place I get them from is usually pretty much uh, you know I, I would consider very reasonable. You know, I know up in Wisconsin, they, you know, they want a gold bullion for them, so. Well, like I said in the beginning of the show, Matt Horvat and I, uh, Matt's been begging me to come out and experience this with him. Matt is like you. Uh, he says, Bob, you got to try this. You really do. There's ways to make it work, and I'm confident that if you go out 
and try this with me, you'll, you'll do a 180 in terms of at least accepting this method of fishing. Uh, yeah. And Matt was telling me the other night that the suckers here that he buys are $15 a pop. That's oh, a yeah. lot of money. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Very you, lot. You've got a really nice piece. Uh, we're going to go uh, quiet here. I'm going to play the piece for you, and it is really, um, it really is setting everything up in your boat, and this is critical. Um, again, I look at this from production value. I look at it from information, and I'm overwhelmed. This is Gary Enos. This is how we wear it. Okay. So we got the adjustments on here already on the sleeve. Through this tender part of his lip. And the reason I use circle hooks, the use of circle hooks instead of wire. See how that length is like perfect. That this sucker will swim perfect in the water and it's almost like fully disguised because of the fluorocarbon. Trip away some or you know um Pick away some of the scales, just under the skin, and then you take the barb out, just like that. Perfect length, disguised by the side, uh, side of the sucker. It's got enough room on it, on the uh, uh, slack in there, that it'll swim perfect. Okay, we're going to put her back here in the harness. Can't even see, you can't even see the wire, can't see the fluorocarbon, nothing. You can just see the hook kind of sticking out the back of that. That's perfect. The reason I use a circle hook on the lip is a lot of times the muskies will get that. About 50% of the time they'll hook that front uh, mouth hook. And instead of having a, a, a cheesy wire hook which kind of breaks away, it'll straighten out on a heavy fish. So I use uh, VMC's circle hooks on these and they're super strong and they got that short shank and it works out perfect. See what you want in a sucker harness and this is where a lot of mistakes were made you want the sucker to be as natural as possible swimming around okay that front weight on there is an ounce and a half and what I call it's the honor system it keeps the sucker down suckers only have a tendency to want to come up to the surface you know, because they're hooked and they they feel secure going up to the surface to swim away, okay? And when, you know, if you keep them down in the strike zone, they have that weight and it's easier for the muskies to also track them down and grab them. I know that sounds a little bit crazy, but the smaller, you can put three-quarter ounce weights on there. The kit comes with three-quarter ounce weight for your smaller suckers. Anything under 10, 10 inches, I put the small three-quarter ounce on, okay? Now look how natural that sucker's swimming around out there. That's what you want. That's perfect, okay? It's not in a C shape where it's too tight and it's got all that wire hanging off. It looks like an antenna. Nothing to give it away. And also the, the hook kind of blends into the sides and the color pattern of the sucker too, all right? We're talking heavily pressured fish. And you can use this Indiana waters. This is where we're fishing right now is Indiana waters. And then you also have any lakes that you have a problem with uh, water clarity okay or like dark waters and stuff like that um, if you're fishing clear water make myself clear on that you don't want the the extra wires and stuff like that to give the sucker away all right so all right what we'll do is I like to cinch down bring up to the surface this is more this is where my measurement is is how much uh, line I have out I just clear the line counter it's at zeros right now okay this is full release and I'm going to, I like to cinch down my drags, especially when I'm sucker fishing, because you're really, you gotta really set the hook on, on suckers, all right? Because you want that to break away. The whole idea is to get that sucker harness to break away from the sucker so you can get all hooks into the muskie's mouth. All right, so right there at zero. And we're gonna run this guy about four feet. We got a lot of sun in the, a lot of light, sunlight penetration, got a little ripple on the water. 
um, you don't want it too close to the surface because muskies will see your movement if you're moving around too much, okay? And if you can look down there, you can see that sucker just swimming around. He's about four feet under the surface. I got a free spool. Something comes up and grabs it or the sucker feels threatened, it's gonna, it's gonna run offline, okay? And that's very loud clicker as opposed to some of the reels that you can use. You can use any type of reel you like um, that have clickers on them, but I like these because they're loud and I can hear that when it wants to tear off, okay? You wanna check the sucker periodically um, to make sure that the hooks aren't coming off or coming out because what happens is as the sucker swimming in the water that meat that you've hooked through kind of tenderizes gets soft and the hooks will back out of it then 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 you're losing contact with the hooks and then the suckers might be hanging off there and if that's the case if a muskie comes up and grabs it you could take a chance on losing the fish or losing the sucker and and that's that's a horrible thing right there because then you a missed opportunity so okay all right, right here, put a slider on. This is a slider, Bob. This is what the, uh, the Wilson sucker harness comes with. It comes with an eight inch fill bobber, standard toothpick. I mean, how cheesy is that? But it's perfect for what I want to use it for. What I do with this, this is the line. This is the, what I call the drag line out behind the back of the boat. Use it anywhere from 20 to 30 feet out behind the back of the boat. And normally what I do is I only usually drop the sucker down after I get the sucker on the harness then I let it out the back and I'll demonstrate that here in a little bit but all you have to do is whatever depth you want just put your toothpick in there and it stops the line from running out it works perfect and what you want to do is this one will run a little bit higher in the water column okay as the boats going along um, it has freedom of movement and it's away from the boat and what it will also do being that it's away from the boat, you might get some of those fish that are kind of uh, suspect about the boat and they'll come out of the weeds or out, off the depths or off the brake lines and come up and grab this thing. So, same harness, you know, like I was saying, kit comes with a slider like this and it comes with the high-tech toothpicks also. <laughs> so, standard toothpicks work perfect. And when you're thinking, wait a minute, when I get the fish up by the boat and I got this on here, when you set the hook hard enough, the, the toothpick discards itself, okay? So it doesn't get in the way when you're trying to, you know, trying to retrieve this and get it in the net. So, all right, we're gonna <clears throat> gonna be fetching on another sucker here. This is for our drag line or the bobber line. I usually don't go as big with the drag line suckers like I do on the on the uh, tight line or the the drop line. All right. All right, what we'll do here, we have this, we have a line sleeve, kind of just do a quick measurement. That's quite a bit. That's quite a bit. We got to adjust this down, kind of shrink this. There again, just pull that sleeve down a little bit, fit the sucker. Right through its lip and the soft tissue. Not this material right here. That's hard to break away into. Like if when you when you want to set the hook and pull it, if that's hooked in that in that cartilage material right there, it's hard to get that hook to rip free. The idea is is to get a clean hook set. Okay. Okay. Brush away some of the scales. Right under the skin. And you want that barb to just pop out and just set, just like that, okay? Now, we'll drop this guy over the side. That's what we consider zero. There's about two, three, about four feet out. Here's where we put our toothpick in, okay? And what we'll do is, we want to get this guy away from the boat. Okay, and I consider this zero away from the boat, right in the rod holder. My drag's already set, super tight. Okay, and then the rod holder and let her go. I usually let it just pull the line out, 
until I get usually around 20. I, I don't usually run um, a, a line out less than 20 feet out behind the back of the boat on the, on the bobber line, okay? And the reason I do that, because I, I, I want to get those missed fish, okay? The fish, and, and the neat thing about the bobber is as, as you're cutting along on a brake line and, and um, that sort of thing, it's able to kind of swing in and get areas and nooks and crannies of the brake line or the weed edge that you didn't get with your drop line or, you know, with the, having a direct line right overside the boat or with casting, okay? Because, you know, muskies do move around quite a bit, all right? You know, they'll move in and off these brake lines out of deep water. They'll be in shallow water, and they'll come out and, and poke their heads out and maybe, you know, uh, scan the area or, you know, do their uh, kind of surveillance, I guess, of their territory. And right there, we're about 25 feet right there. I'm going to leave that out, okay? Got the clicker on it. She's free spool. <clears throat> She's ready to go. So we got our so we got our rig set up right now. This is this is how I do the live bait rigging. Any more than two, it's going to be a nightmare. Some guys could do, you know, set up. Uh, you could do uh, planer boards and that sort of thing if you got a good drift going on. But I think that's a that's a lot of heartache and that's a lot of things to mess with. You get one fish on on a sucker rig, and you're going to be sitting there and you have issues with tangling and stuff like that, you don't want that. Two is good, two works perfect, okay? So when you do get a fish to come up and eat one of these lines, um, it's not anything to crank the other one up or bring it out or even leave it out because some, in some situations you could be in a feeding window where you could get up to two fish on at the same time. That's happened before. And there's nothing like having 100 inches of fish in the, in the net at one time, that's cool. So. So what we do is we just be patient now, uh, but um, in, in the middle of what we're doing, what we want to do is we want to try to draw fish into our lures or into our suckers. What we're trying to do is trying to bring fish out of the brake lines and stuff and, and looking for active fish. And so what, what I'll be doing is I'll be doing some casting. And what will happen is that's why you have this, the tight line works so good. Muskies like to follow. We all know that. They like to, they like to follow the lure to the boat. And what happens is they see the, the sucker hanging over the side of the boat, they see it swimming around, flashing, it's an easier prey, they'll turn on that and grab that tight line. Or, if they come up and look at the tight line sucker, and as you're dragging that bobber line or the drag line behind the back of the boat, they'll come up and grab that at times too. So, you know, it's like a, a three-edged sword. So you got lures, you got a, a tight line on your sucker here, three, four feet down, and then you got the one that you're dragging out 25, 20 to 30 feet behind the back of the boat. It works perfect. It's a perfect system. Hi everyone, Bob Nasekomer here for Grant Rods. You know, musky fishing's a tough deal. And the job's not done till she's in the bag. Well, how do you do that? It's pretty simple. You need big dog rods from Grant Rods. For your next rod, call them at 847-577-0848. Building custom rods since 1983. been excellent. Uh, Randy did a great job. The guiding service. So Randy started taking us out when I was 10. And we've been catching big muskies ever since. The accommodations here are fantastic. Check out Century Lodge on Osborne Bay. Come on, bring her back. Like I said, folks, I wasn't going to let you down. One of the most informative pieces that I've ever seen. If you didn't come away knowing how Gary sets things up, uh, the rod placement, how he's putting on his minnows, his minnow choices, um, then you're simply not paying attention. We have an awful lot of people on here tonight, and I've noticed I have a couple people commenting that they might not have enough bandwidth in their area. Just bear with us. We'll post this. You'll be able to come back here at Fish and Sticks Facebook page and watch it so you're not missing anything. Uh, but you do have to have adequate up and down speed on your internet in order to really enjoy what we're doing. Say, so, Gary, a uh, couple of things. Yeah. Um, 
there was a mention of multiple rods being used. In Indiana, what's, what's your law on multiple rods? Um, we can have up to three rods in Indiana, okay? That's where the, uh, the drop line and then the, the drag line, the bobber line, and then I'm able to cast. So, but normally I don't run any more than, than two sucker rods at a time, you know, yeah. just to try to keep everything straight. You know, because mass confusion can be horrible in that situation. So that's usually all I run is two sucker rods normally. Yeah, that's what you were saying on the video clip, too. You want to manage that situation so it's not pandemonium in the boat. Um, yes. In a case, let's say, for instance, uh, here in Minnesota, we can only use one rod at a time. And yeah. I personally think that's a, a pretty good deal. Um, we yeah. have a great fishery. We have a, a large season. So yeah. um, fishing with one rod, in my opinion, is just fine. Now, that said, would you, if let's say there's three of us in the boat and we're prepared to fish suckers, uh, would you would you really insist on or request that one person be trying to draw fish to the boat with a jerk bait or a blade bait of yeah. some sort? Oh, absolutely. Um, that's, that's funny you bring that up because I've been up to Minnesota before and we've, you know, we've talked about this fishing basically on Vermilion and, you know, we, we, we talked about, you know, getting large suckers and everybody looked at us like we were crazy. And, uh, you know, you know, so one of us would give up, you know, casting, you know, just to tend, you know, a sucker rod, you know, for those following fish, you know, especially on Vermilion, you got those monsters in there. So that would be, that would be a phenomenal way to, <laughs> to get those following fish to turn around and, and, and go after, you know, live bait presentation, especially, you know, in the fall time of the year. So what would you? Yeah, that would. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that, no. Go ahead, Bob. That's what, fine. What, what would you recommend? Is jerk baits? Um, I, I noticed you were throwing a jerk bait in your video clip. Is that a preference, or was that just a bait you had on the rod? I, I know I've gotten in the boat many oh. times, and just because it's on the rod, I start throwing it. <laughs> well, um, I on the lake I was fishing, I'm I'm very inclined to using that glider jerk bait type, and um, you know. You know, if, if you're bringing fish to the boat, you know, sometimes the preference doesn't really matter. You know, it just depends on, you know, your water temperature and what you feel comfortable throwing. Uh-huh. So, yeah. you know, that could be, you know, the fisherman's choice. But, uh, yeah, having, you know, having a huge sucker hanging out the back of the boat, as you can see, you know, always helps. You know, I mean, you know, the, the suckers I did have weren't, you know, in the video, weren't giants by any, by any, uh, by any measure, but uh, you know, as uh, as the water gets cooler in in the fall, I, I like those the giants. You know, if you want to catch a giant fish, giant suckers, it just works. Matt's talking sixteen inches. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. So, that's a pretty yeah, large bait. Yeah, at least sixteen. You know, if you want to catch a big fish, Bob. You know, you know the you know the recipe. You know, I mean, it's a it's a very very deliberate, you know, presentation. These fish are used to seeing suckers in the water column, and so, you know, the the bigger girls, you know, they they want to just like, okay, I'm going to eat that. And I'm I'm done for a, a half a day, and then I don't have to mess with it anymore. So. You know, that's why they'll come up and they'll they'll follow the sucker around. And it's amazing to watch them commit to a sucker. It's, you know, when I have clients in the boat and they can watch that, it's like a, a video game for them. It's very entertaining. So, and see, Matt, you know, it, Matt used the same analogy when he and I were talking about it. And he was literally saying, you got to do it, you got to do it, you got to do it. He says, Bob, you'll be right over the top of these fish. Mm -hmm. it, it's going to blow you away. Now, let me give you a little history on what Matt has been doing the last couple of weeks. Um, a 48, they mm -hmm. missed one about 50. They got two or three 47 to 45s. And right. 
all on suckers. So yes, he's the he says it's uh, it's happening now. I noticed in your video clip uh, a little bit of steam coming off the water, uh, pretty much indicating you got cold, cold water there. Well, you know, I, I don't want this to be you know misinformation. That was in the springtime, actually. Oh, it was in the that spring. Was, that was in April. Uh huh. That was in mid-April. Um, and that's one of the things I, I can, if I can get suckers in that early stages of the season, I'm going to do it. And, you know, and then in the fall, that's the reason the size of the suckers were, you know, they were like 12 inches. I think they weren't monstrous, 10 to 12. And then, um, in the fall, I always go for anything from 16 inches or the biggest thing in the tank. So that's what I moved to. But, uh, yeah, the, I mean, your cold water periods are fantastic for live bait. Yeah, see, we and, can't, we can't, in Minnesota, we can't fish them until into June. So we will never right. have that experience. Um, right. One of the questions that has cropped up many, many times is how do you know when to set the hook? What's the barometer? What's the measure on that, Gary? How do you know when you're going to set the hook? Um, one of the things that, you know, it's, you, you feel the tension on the fish, and when the fish wants to turn and and go the other direction, that's when you set the hook. You know, because um, at that very first uh, fish, uh, remember in the video, um, I, I set it too early because the fish wasn't ready to kind of move away. And so what I what I like to do is kind of move the boat with the fish, and then I feel the tension on then I set the hook. Um, as far as, you know, gut hooking, no. If, if I was getting into a position where I was gut hooking these fish, I wouldn't even mess with the light bait, you know, because I got questioned on that before on my videos, and I'm like, uh, no, if I'm killing muskie, I'm not going to use light bait. So, well, Matt, uh, Matt Horvack, the other day when he and I were talking, he called me up on the water. They had just boated like a 48, and he mm -hmm. said they had a Goliath fish well over 50, came in, took a 17, 18 inch sucker, and sure. it, it, it crashed it. He said it's, it was like we should have owned the fish, and we set up on it and got absolutely nothing. And he said this thing really just annihilated this sucker. So not every fish you're going to come into contact with is even going to get a hook. So right. you right. mentioned hook setting on a fish. Let's take just a couple of seconds, Gary. We're going to go we're going to go on to your last piece and this is literally the hook set. So for those of you who are asking questions regarding the hook set and some of these issues, Gary's going to cover them for you. Don't go anywhere. Watch this. casting here along the uh, brake line. Actually, Probably about 18. Alright, we're casting here along the uh, brake line. Actually, we're hitting right on the weed edge. Okay. And we're sitting at about 14 feet of water right here. There's a good, nice taper brake line for this lake. And uh, what, what I'm trying to do is trying to get the active fish to come out off the brake if they're in the shallows or if they're right on the brake line, okay? And uh, if you can see, we got that our, our uh, drag line, our bobble line, is out in probably about 18 feet of water right off the secondary brake on this lake. We got our sucker right here beside the boat, 
well, about eight feet back, and I can see him down there swimming around. So that means um, if I can bring up a fish, bring up the muskie to the boat, and they don't want to eat the lure, you know, right there is a natural presentation, you know, for a fish, you know, if they, if they, you know, want a sucker. Um, right now I'm working a glider. I'm probably casting in, probably, it's probably about four feet. It's got newly formed weeds up there. Working the glide bait, and I'm, I'm working in a very slow methodical pattern. Get that side to side. Get that side to side uh, swim going. Man off like 10 feet of line. So you got a fish on. Okay. I'm going to let him run a little bit more. I'm going to leave that bobber line out because I'm not going to mess with it because everything will be too close to the boat. Right now he's just sitting there. You can watch that rod tip. As you watch that rod tip, you can see him. He's actually moving the sucker around in his mouth right now. See that? He's just like straight down. This is awesome. He's moving it. I want him to do like a second run. Okay. When he takes off, I'm going to nail him. Still working it. He's wanting to go. Got him. Oh. Swing and a miss. He's down there yet. Get chat on video. See him down there under it? Mm -hmm. That's a big fish. Come on, baby. Okay, now you don't want to do anything. You just got to let the sucker do its wounded thing right now. That muskie's still under it. See him looking at it. Just release its swim bladder. Sizing him up. Look at that. Come on, baby. Right into the sun here. Okay, here he is. He's not giving up on it. Took a swipe. She's going to come up and grab it right now. She'll come up and grab it. She's sizing it up, is what she's doing. She had it in her mouth before. Yep, she still comes in. Don't mind us, we're just friendly camera crew, documenting nature. Are you kidding me? Grabbed it by the head. She just grabbed it. Got her. <laughs> How sweet was that? Now she wants to play. I got her hooked right in the corner of the mouth. It's perfect, and she's still got the sucker, sucker in there. Still got a lot of juice in her tank.
Heavy fish. Talk to me about persistence. Never give up. There we go. Never give up on those suckers. Never reel them in fast. Never reel them in too fast. As you can look at this fish, <clears throat> she is, she's hooked right in the treble hook that was dangling right here. That fish is, uh, you might think, okay, she had it too long or whatever, but no, she didn't. When I set the hook the first time, remember I talked about from the very beginning, that treble or the, that circle hook ripped out when I set the hook the first time. That ripped out of her lip, but the treble stayed intact. That's why we had still contact with the sucker. You don't want to bring it in. Just because it's swimming weird or whatever, okay, just let it go. And then, you know, as you saw, she just came up and grabbed it head first, and, and she committed. And we got the hooks right in the corner of her mouth. It's, the fish is, like, not pleased right now, but uh, she's unharmed. I'm going to get her out here and take a look at her. Right now, her ego's kind of beat up. So, not a bad fish. I like using these playing gloves. A little protection. And that was on the bigger sucker. Now this isn't a monster muskie, but by any stretch, but... There we go. See? Ain't that nice little fish. Not beat up or anything. Nice little Indiana muskie. Measure out. Uh, she's about what, 36 and a half inches? That, that sucker that I had her with, <clears throat> that was about a 12 to 13 inch sucker. See ya. There it is. That's the best thing about musky fishing is catch and release, man. All right, we just got a little, little fella here. Just came up and ate. There we go. Not a bad guy. No. Really green. Like 3.2 seconds. That sucker never had a chance. Got it. Thank you, sir. Not the best camera job on that one. <laughs> Pretty cool, though. Um, brought her in right there as a prime example. Bringing him in on the on the lure. Came chasing in after the lure. Swam around the back side of the boat. Okay. And all of a sudden, she just came up and like split second came up and ate the sucker. I mean, it was on. I mean, it was over. That fish was automatically hooked. We didn't have to wait on anything. Nice clean Indiana muskie. Pretty cool, huh? Real aggressive no matter what their size. He's out of here. Sweet. Two for two. <laughs> There we go. There we go.
fish we're after, huh? Cool. Oh, fatty. Right about 37, 38, something like that. She's been eating good. I gotta get her back in the water. Three suckers, three fish. Three Wilsons. Three Wilsons, yes. Three Wilsons, three fish. But there, you know, you, you, you get the fish to strike based on reaction, okay? And once they do that, their natural predator instincts kick in and boom, they're on the fish. They'll, they'll be on the suckers like that. That's, that's why right there's the reason I use suckers. Days like this, you have these you know, high bluebird skies that people think, I'm gonna stay at home, the fishing's gonna stink. We got three in the boat already using suckers. We've only seen a couple on lures, so cool. Let's try another. It is cool, no doubt about it. Uh, Gary, you had in that sequence, at the beginning of the sequence, you had a fish come in, the first fish that you caught, and you did the hook set on it, you missed the fish, left the, the minnow back, left the sucker back in the water, and the fish yep. took about probably, I don't know, go back and look at the video, 60 seconds or so before it actually committed. And when it was done, yep. so it came up and bumped the sucker at the end. Mm -hmm. So you had a sense of smell and appetite that you were like that. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Off the internet here, they're asking why when you hook your sucker, you're hooking it on the side of the fish, Um, that's like trial and error. Um, I, I like to, um, make the hook, the treble hook as more of a part of the fish than the stand out. In Indiana, we get a lot of pressured fish. So I try to disguise as much as I possibly can, uh, the hook and, you know, the, that's the use of the fluorocarbon also. So less visibility, I guess. That's, where that comes in. You're making it work. I mean, you're making it work. Like for you, three fish in a day, I don't care who you are, three fish in a day is a good day. And um, huh. you're getting good work. Tell us a little bit about your guide family here. Tell us a little bit about how folks can get a hold of you, what you can offer them, the fall, the year. It's obviously yeah. that um, an opportunity to get people out and let them experience it firsthand. Tell us a little bit about Gary Kupke and Gary Kupke. Um, oh, okay. Well, thanks, Bob. Um, well, number one, I've been musky fishing probably 37 years, something like that. And, um, I fish in, uh, the North Webster area, North Central Indiana. Um, Webster Lake is, uh, well known in Indiana. And a lot of people don't even think of Indiana when they think of musky fishing. But, uh, in the area, I have, uh, the Tippy Canoe chain I fish, uh, the Barbie chain of lakes. And then I have three other lakes uh, that I fish that are a little bit east of me. And all these lakes are are stocked, you know, uh, not only by the state, but uh, by uh, private clubs and stuff like that. So um, we don't have a closed season in Indiana. That's the nice thing. Um, we do have some spawning that goes on but as far as the the fishery goes everything is usually stocked okay um you know if you want to get a hold of me that would be great my phone number is 
And you can reach me um, on email, uh, Gary Muskynut, that's M-U-S-K-I-E-N-U-T at AOL.com. Or you can reach me on Facebook also with a private message. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have an opportunity to get out this week, I hope, uh, with the band, <laughs> more of that, and, and see if we can find this ourselves, because it should be a part of the sport that I took this part of my nose up at uh, <laughs> for selfish reasons, um, maybe because I have this fear factor that you're, we're getting hurt, you mentioned it yourself, about people are actually going to take the hook to you, and you yep. Mm-hmm. And a skill set given, I think that this might be a very viable thing. Do you have, um, I, I know it's been in, implemented whole, so I don't know how that may or may not be the case. Do you find yourself getting an opportunity to take somebody that, that got handicapped out and given an opportunity to win with this kind of technique? Uh, yes, I have in the past. Um, you know, this guy was a quadriplegic and he was rigged up with, um, this air triggered, uh, hook setter that he had on his wheelchair. Um, he had some opportunities, but because of boat control, um, we weren't able to get him hooked up, but yes, it's very possible. All right, we should be back up. We ran out of microphone there for a second, so we get it back up and running. Uh, your answer was yes, you do get a chance to yes. do this paraplegic. That was a great opportunity. You took great advantage of it. I'm certain whoever it was that got in the boat with you shared a memorable experience. You know, fishing yeah. is fishing, and sometimes we equate the success of fishing to the actual catching process. And I've been around enough guides over the years that the good guides, the guides that are really on top of the game, um, they spend as much time communicating with the person in the boat with them, uh, teaching them the nuances, expanding, if you would, their horizon in the sport of fishing. And I get the sense that, Gary, you do that. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's, that's where I, I got the name, I guess, and it, you know, everything's an experience, so, <laughs> you know, there you go, take the value out of that. So. <laughs> I want to I recap real quick, if I can, if everybody will just pay attention to me for just a second here. I'm on the soapbox. I want you to understand that in that summer peak, you probably only need one sense of these fish to be tripped to get the fish to go. As the season progresses on and you start getting into that 67 degree range, you can expect two of those senses that need to be engaged for that fish to be a candidate for your bag. And if you're moving on into the colder weather and you're starting to see the 50 degree range, you might just need three of those senses to go. And the portion that we were talking about today on the show just about requires four. You need sight, sound, smell, and taste for these fish to go. It's pretty much a given fact. It just is. Gary, I want to say something, too. I like your net system you have in the boat, the way you have your handle set up there. That was yeah. That's pretty slick. You can work that thing one-handed, one person in the boat. That's a pretty neat yep. deal. Yeah. Pretty yep. cool deal. Hey, listen, I want to say thanks for coming on the show. You guys get a hold of Gary. Call him 574-275-1886. That's 574-275-1886. It's Gary's Musky Experience LLC. Find him on Facebook. And, uh, man, look him up. Uh, he's got a lot of season in front of him right now. Uh, if he's got openings in that boat, you might want to take advantage of it. And it sounds to me like 
Springtime is also good. We just saw yeah. a video of it. So if you have uh, if you have a need or a desire to get out there in the spring when things are warming up, then give Gary a shout. Gary, maybe our paths will cross this winter someplace at a sports show. I hope they do. I'd like to say hi sure. to you in person. Thank you for what we're doing. And again, sure, uh, I want to say thanks for coming on the show. Sure. Hey, um, Bob, I want to correct you on my phone number real quick. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Right. Yeah, it is 574-275-1885. Oh, what did I say? You added a number. You added a six to the back end. <laughs> oh, there you go. All right, so it is 574-275-1885. That's 574-275-1885. Good thing you corrected me. Boy, oh boy, sure. we would have had people calling somebody else and they'd have been mad. <laughs> yeah, they're going to be asking for Gary. Yeah, right on. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again right. for coming on the show, and uh, thanks for uh, giving us an opportunity to meet you and see what you do on the water. It's my pleasure, young man. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Take you, care. You bet. Hey, folks, remember, right. remember. Um, I want to let you know you've been watching Fishing Sticks here on Facebook. Uh, on every show, every week, um, we bring on guests. We try to bring on guests. We bring on interesting topics. And if you have questions or comments, you can post them live at the show or you can send them post-show to bob.m at fishandstickstv.com. That's bob.m at fishandstickstv.com. And we will try to answer any questions you have. Now, keep in mind... Uh, it takes a little bit of time for me to get to some of these, so if you send it you don't get an answer in 48 hours, don't get disgruntled. It'll be coming. I'll get to it. And do us a really big favor. Please share our videos. Please tell your friends. And don't forget to like us. There's a like button on there. There's a share button on the Facebook page. We just appreciate it if you would help us grow the show. Uh, that's so important to us. And with that being said, there are people who help us along. They pay our bills for us. And, oh, oh before I go there, um, we're getting closer to knowing exactly what the details are going to be in terms of pricing for which bay. It sounds like uh, Steve and Gail are going to offer us a special deal up there. So if you're one of the people that are on the list, you expect a phone call or an email from myself or Jim here in the next few days giving you all the details. So that being said, these are the people that make our show a possibility. There, on your left, you can almost see it. One of the most magnificent sights on the planet, Lake Athabasca nestled just below the 60th parallel. Lake Athabasca hasn't changed in nearly a thousand years with its pristine shorelines, pure crystal clear water you can actually drink, and countless fish. Boy, has she got fish that is for everyone willing to travel to Other Side River Lodge. From the magnificent world-class northern pike that prowl these waters to the oldest and biggest lakers on the globe, Athabasca has it all. Other Side River Lodge caters to the true sportsman seeking an all-American plan guided package with three incredible meals a day and memories you won't find anywhere else. Records have been broken by guests at Other Side River Lodge in the past. You could be next. Book your dream trip of a lifetime to Other Side River Lodge, where fishing dreams do come true. Call Cliff or Stella toll-free at 1-877-922-0957. Oh, look at that. Oh, big fish. Big fish! Is that over here? That is a 50 fish. <laughs> Folks, you're seeing it right now. My 100 just came in the net. At Witch Bay Camp. Holy smokes, Rocky. He ate that thing. The summer sun never sets upon the Alaskan pike of the Yunoko, in the heart of breathtaking Alaska. Evenings will be shared reliving the battles of monster pike. The midnight sun trophy pike hunt is on aboard the 67 foot luxury houseboat, and you're in command. If you're not, you should be. Contact the Midnight Sun Trophy Pike Adventures by calling 800-440-7453 or email them at mstpa50 at gmail.com. Bring her back. Oh, hold tight, hold tight. 
Hi everyone, Bob Mason over here. You know, I've got a place, a very, very special place in my heart. It's Osborne Bay. It's been excellent. Uh, Randy did a great job guiding service. Uh, Randy started taking us out when I was 10. Catching big muskies ever since. The accommodations here are fantastic. Check out Century Lodge on Osborne Bay. Come on, bring her back. Hi everyone, Bob Nasacomer here for Grant Rods. You know, muskie fishing's a tough deal, and the job's not done till she's in the bag. Well, how do you do that? It's pretty simple. You need big dog rods from Grant Rods. For your next rod, call them at 847-577-0848. Building custom rods since 1983. All right, so this week I'll be heading out with Matt Horvat. We're going to be doing some sucker fishing. He's going to explain to me what I've been missing. I think you guys saw a little bit of it tonight. Um, Gary was a magnificent guest. His videos were production perfect. He did a very good job on them. My hat's off to Gary. Um, Matt is, like I said, Matt's been begging me for six or seven years to open up my eyes and experience that. Um, so we're going to try it. So we'll spend uh, we'll spend the week shooting some video and see if we can come back next week with just an update um, and let you know what we've done, what we've accomplished. Now Matt's got his own rig. Matt's got his own rig that he's developed. It may be different than what Gary's using, and that is part of the learning curve. Uh, there are, I'm sure, there's a variety of different systems out there. Uh, I have little doubt of it. Um, so. That being said, I'll learn even more. This is what Fishing Sticks Live is all about. Fishing Sticks TV is to teach people. It's to enlighten myself. Like I said when I started this series, um, I don't know everything. I don't profess to know everything, and I don't know anybody that does. So that said, the more of us that come open and share, uh, the better off we are. We've covered a lot of different fishing. Um, if you guys would like to see some peacock fishing down in Brazil, uh, more musky fishing, northern pike fishing, walleye fishing, we've got it all. Smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, we have it all. We have everything. And as we go forward, we're going to be getting even more. I want to say God bless to everybody. This is Fish and Sticks TV Live. I'm Bob Mesacomer, your host. Hoping that everybody enjoyed tonight's show. Thanks for letting us come into your living rooms, on your private devices, your portable devices, and sharing these, uh, these very precious moments with us. I know you could be doing a hundred different things. To tune in and to watch what we're doing is very gratifying. And I can't tell you enough um, how much that means to me. God bless. We'll see you next week.